I am now going to turn it over to an esteemed board member of Philanthropy New York, Joan Steinberg. I know. They're Hi, everybody. So if folks want to grab their seat, we're going to get started in just a minute. Um, I am the president of the Morgan Stanley Foundation, but I'm here really today as one of the board members of Philanthropy New York. Um, so welcome to everybody, and particularly those watching on our live feed. And I think that Michael already did this, but a big thank you to Ford Foundation for hosting us. And I'm a little late because I was standing in their lobby staring at all the plants. <laughs> um, uh, so the goal, the goal of this segment of our day is to better understand um, climate change in the region and what we should be thinking about in terms of infrastructure. Um, and since I know absolutely nothing about that, um, I get to introduce somebody who does. Um, before I do that, I want to just give one little plug, which I think Michael just started, but I'm louder, um, which is just that this, this session and today was really based on about six months of work that's been happening at Philanthropy New York around Sandy and uh, various aspects around it. And I think you heard him just mention, but we are really hoping to convene on the anniversary a uh, What's Happened in a Year series. And so if folks would like to be engaged in that or they have ideas about what they'd like to see covered, because we are a membership organization, would you please be in touch with, with Michael Romali? If you guys don't know him, he's right here, the QD, right? waving. Um, but it would, this is really a membership, but you're supposed to get out of it what you want. So if there are things that you would like to see us do as an organization around Sandy or any other topic where your audience, please let us know. Um, so now it is my pleasure to introduce Nancy Pete, who is right there and waving at me. Excellent. Um, she's going to moderate our panel. She's also the person who was kind enough to uh, introduce us to Dr. Cynthia Rosenzweig, our main presenter. Um, so she's a managing director at the Rockefeller Foundation, and excuse me for reading, I'm just going to mention a little about you. Um, but she leads the foundation's global work on resilience, including developing strategies and practice for infusing resilience thinking throughout the foundation's work. She was instrumental in connecting Philanthropy New York with Dr. Rosenzweig, as I mentioned, and has advised our organization on its Sandy work over the past few months. Before joining the Rockefeller Foundation, Dr. Keats spent 13 years at the World Resources Institute, first as a director of climate, energy, and pollution program, and then as the founder and director of Embark, a distinguished program that catalyzed environmental, environmentally sustainable transport solutions to improve quality of life in cities in Mexico, Brazil, India, Turkey, and the Andean region. Um, this could go on for like a month, and she's obviously smarter than I am, so rather than me talking, I'd like to bring up Dr. Pete. Thank you, Joan. That was very kind. And I want to also thank Michael and uh, Philanthropy New York for organizing us all here to talk about Sandy and post-Sandy and what we'll all do over the next, think about, help us think about what we'll all do over the coming years to help rebuild the New York, New Jersey region resiliently and um, extend my thanks to the Ford Foundation for hosting us all here today. Uh, but I am especially pleased to moderate this panel and to present to you Dr. Cynthia Rosenzweig. And for those of you who don't know her, she's actually a national treasure. She's been one of the principal authors in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. She's based at Columbia University and um, uh, the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, where she heads the Climate Impacts Group. Um, more locally, she c has been the co-chair of the New York City Panel on Climate Change, um, a body of experts convened by the mayor to advise the city on adaptation of the critical infrastructure and more than just infrastructure, I think, for the city. She um, co-led the Metropolitan East Coast Regional Assessment of the U.S. National Assessment of the Potential Consequences of Climate Variability and Change, sponsored by the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which is the cabinet-level association of, uh, or coordination of all global change work in the United States. Um, her list of accomplishments, talk about <laughs> talk about complimenting up. Her list of accomplishments would go, go on and on and on, and she is way smarter than I am, um, as you will see from her presentation. And um, so she's going to give an overview of how to understand climate science, what's happening in the atmosphere, how it translates into climate and into weather and into storms and other things that affect us, and then what that means to a particular place like New York City, and she works with people like her from around the world to help everybody try to understand this and then think about what to do about it. And after about half an hour, we'll, we'll then, um, uh, Cynthia and I have just agreed over Michael's objection to change it and flip some of the questions over to you. 
But in the meantime, during her presentation, there'll be a point where you'll be asked to answer some specific questions by text. And you'll tee us up for how to do that? OK, so we're going to have some interactive uh, exchange with you all during Cynthia's presentation, and then a chance for more open, typical end of panel discussion. And with that, I'd like to introduce Cynthia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you to Philanthropy New York for inviting me to uh, make this presentation and to share with you some lessons learned and way forward. Do I have to turn something on here? Hold on. Yes, I think I'm supposed to. I just turned on this. Um, to uh, lessons learned and the way forward from not just me as a scientist, but science colleagues and research colleagues from around the city. And, and also around the world, who have been working just here in New York City for over, we realized, 15 years on the potential impacts of climate change on the New York City region. And I want to highlight in particular my, my co-chair of the New York City Panel on Climate Change, Bill Selecki, who's the director of the Institute for Sustainable Cities at, Hunter, at CUNY Hunter, and also just the dedicated researchers and scientists who have been working on this um, even way, way, way before Hurricane Sandy. So I'm going to, um, if you could, if uh, the tech folks could bring up on this screen too, that would be great, if it's possible. Yes, great. Um, so very briefly, I'm going to talk about the New York City Panel on Climate Change and the approach that, that we used to uh, help provide the science information for uh, the New York City decision makers. Then I'm going to do a quick tour d'horizon of what do we mean with climate change and how do we actually begin to inter you know, interact with it? Well, we interact with it by, by looking at what are our current climate stresses, and then from those risks that we have today, we then look to see what the uh, science, science is telling us about how those risks may change in the future. Then, of course, if it were just about the, ch claiming the changing climate, well, all the scientists would be very interested. But really, it's because those climate stresses, as we know so well, have impacts, impacts on the people and places and infrastructure of not just our city, but of course, everywhere around the world. So that's why we have to turn to the real challenge of adapting to the changing climate conditions. Then I'm going to turn to, to specifically about Hurricane Sandy, what specifically uh, are the challenges posed by Hurricane Sandy, and what lessons are we learning just from this mega event or superstorm that we've had, and finally uh, draw, draw things together at the end. So when we look to see in New York City how, how have we be begun to address climate change and why, it goes back to 2007 when Mayor Bloomberg and his team um, d created Plan YC, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. And the plan, Plan YC, featured 10 goals, so some very, very usual um, sustainable type of things in regard to housing, water, clean water, transportation, etc. And the last one was a climate change uh, uh, goal in terms of reducing the emissions of climate change. But then, as the, as the operational, uh, op, as the plan began to be operationalized, uh, everyone realized, I think we all realized, that climate change and a changing climate, changing climate conditions would affect every single one of those goals. If we're going to be providing clean water, well, we have to know what our water supply will be in the future. So from that, then, Mayor Bloomberg, because of that reason, with that motivation, Mayor Bloomberg and the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability created the first New York City adaptation process, and that began in 2008. And this is a um, uh, slide showing the process that, that, was, that was really followed uh, here. And you can see 2008, right? That was, you know, in the whole scheme of things, quite a while ago. So what, what was, and one of the things that we say on the adaptation slide, is, uh, on the adaptation side is adaptation is a process. It's not any one particular thing because adaptation is hundreds, thousands, if not, you know, millions of things when we really think about it. So what are the key ingredients of the process that New York City has been, has been following? 
The first is leadership, that Mayor Bloomberg stood up and provided and said, this is important for all of us to do and to take on board. But climate change is actually complicated, and it needs coordination, too. So the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability provides that, that coordination uh, in terms of the adaptation programs and planning for New York City. Then on the left-hand side are, was the Climate Change Adaptation Task Force. And this was, by the way, this part was focused on the critical infrastructure of New York. There's, we're going to talk about communities later, which are so, so critical and so important. But here, the task force was the real, actual people in the city who are responsible for keeping our critical infrastructure going. And what's interesting is that, that it's not just, those aren't just public agencies. As we know, there's not just city agencies, there's regional authorities, and private stakeholders were there as well. For example, all our cell pro phone providers were there, the private corporations who, who, have, who, um, who provide our cell phone uh, service. And of course, they, with this, all those cell phone towers all around, they are actually vulnerable as well. On the uh, right-hand side is the climate science input. And uh, so this is the New York City Panel on Climate Change that also it had, had members who were both from university uh, um, and, and public side, but also private sector experts, including the insurance. Uh, there were members of uh, the uh, insurance uh, sector, uh, legal, uh, legal experts. Uh, we have one chapter, and this is the report that came out of this, that was written by 10 New York City lawyers. So, which of course, the getting, getting these changes into standards and regulations is very important. So this was the process that New York City was following. Now, again, because this challenge of resilience and, uh, and adaptation is so vast, it's very important to start with, what's the overall idea? And this is a uh, slide which very basically describes the, very, the, the idea of climate adaptation. And first, the way to frame it, it's like the framing, or framework of it, which is a risk management issue. So what we see is risk on the, on the y-axis, time going through time, because climate change is a long-term issue. And the wavy blue line is our collective societal understanding of an acceptable level of risk. We all know, we all know what we want our uh, our environment, our governments, uh, to provide that level of protection against climate risks. And you see that it's wavy because that goes up and down. For example, that level of risk for tolerance probably is down now lower because of Hurricane Sandy. We want more protection now, and we need more protection. We're realizing we need more protection. Sometimes if we haven't had a big storm for a long time, maybe then, oh, we're saying, okay, we can handle it. And th so it does go up and down. The blue line is, if we don't do anything, this is the status quo, with, because of our changing climate, the, the climate is going to take us above our acceptable societal level of risk. If we are rigid and we only do one set of things, let's say in each of our systems, we're also eventually, that will delay going above that acceptable level of risk a little while perhaps, but eventually because of the, the sort of, the, because of the relentless trajectory of the increasing climate risk with climate change, we will eventually, we will also exceed. What we need to do is be on the yellow and the, yellow and the green to, through time, keep our region, keep our city, keep our infrastructure, keep our people underneath the acceptable societal level of risk. And this is going to take what we call there flexible in the MPCC, flexible adaptation pathways. So we have to make decisions not once and for all, but we have to take decisions, take actions, and then we have to monitor and reassess them to see as we go into the future. Now the yellow one, the yellow line is if we just do adaptation alone, the green one is the line that we really need to be on, which is a combination of both resilience and adaptation um, so that we can reduce the long-term risks with reducing greenhouse gas emissions as well as adapting and being resilient to the climate changes that we have. So that's the overall framing.
Now, I mentioned the foundation report. So we do, we do, we do foundation things like this, but then we also create workbooks that then folks who are uh, managing the infrastructure can use very easily. And so those are all on the Plan YC website. Very quickly, what are our region's climate stresses? We all know what they are. Extreme heat and heat waves, intense precipitation and flooding. We have our nor'easters, our two types of storms, nor'easters and tropical cyclones and hurricanes. So as scientists, one of the things we do and the information that we provide and what we're doing constantly is work, looking at all these climate hazards and understanding them. What's the, how do we define it? Number, maximum, number of days with maximum temperature over 90. What are recent examples and how well did we respond, let's say here to July in 2011, when we experienced two and a half times more days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit than in our entire history since 1870. We have current intense precipitation events. Again, we have in 2011, the top 10 uh, rainfall, August rainfall in Central Park, 2011 by far exceeded the record. And here's the uh, storm in 2007 in August that, that wiped out all, I, I, some of you I'm sure were here in the city then, and it wiped out all of the subway lines in the city during that storm. On the nor'easter side, we have the back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back storm of 2011. Um, which are very important and scientifically actually very hard to, to uh, really see what may happen to nor'easters uh, into the future. And then of course we have our hurricanes, which bring coastal flooding, storm surge, all the things we know about. And you know, Sandy, we have, we, of course that's the one in our minds right now, but remember back even just in August 2011, Hurricane Irene and the damage that it it caused, not just in our region, but actually uh, inland in upstate New York and Vermont. Okay, how do, we, how do we create the knowledge that can be operationalized for the decision makers and the communities here in the city? So what we do is we take global climate scenarios, we combine them with local climate change information, and the first step is to see what are those risk factors that we need to work on. When we, the, the, the graph on the left is the different projections of greenhouse gas emissions because we don't know what our global decision makers will take in terms of um, uh, reducing the, the greenhouse gas emissions around the world. And then we create scenarios looking at first what's happened in terms of this is temperature for um, uh, in, over the past 100 years, and then the projections into the future. So this is a base of knowledge that can be used as we plan for the recovery of Hurricane Sandy because this um, information is in place. We did tear sheets, because we did this in conjunction with the decision makers and the stakeholders, we, we, have, we, we worked hard to make this accessible. These are called the tear sheets of showing what the actual numbers will be. And we have also, we also show maps. So this is the, these are the latest um, projections of uh, temperature rise for the United States. These are being used in the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the US for the 2050s in the highest greenhouse gas emissions. And here's the pop-up which shows the projections. Um, this is mean of 35, mile, of, of, of 35 global climate models downscaled to our region. And what we're seeing is for our New York region, it's on the order of, uh, in the mean case, the order of six to seven degrees Fahrenheit warming, even by the 2050s. Key, of course, climate risk and variable, right? A climate hazard is the is sea level. And here in the first NPCC, we created from the models, we, we did it two ways. One was coming from the models, one was coming from the rapid ice melt. Um, this is the uh, Arctic sea ice um, uh, information sh showing its decline. Um, and then from those projections, then we create maps that um, show potential areas. It's, it's basically, it's not showing something that someone could go to say, my house is actually um, at vulnerable, but it's certainly showing the key regions in the city that are vulnerable to, this is the one in 100 year storm uh, with the sea level rise uh, added on. Now, 
It's extreme events, of course, that are the most important, that are very, very important. Mean changes are also critical. But extreme events are the ones that we relate to. So we spend a lot of time projecting how extreme heat events will change, heavy precipitation, droughts, and coastal flooding. And we, when, we, when we, we give information, both quantitatively, when we feel it's strong enough, qualitatively, for example, on the intense hurricanes, it's very hard to know for sure what will happen, put multi-factors. But the hurricanes, we, we, uh, we say that they are um, more likely than not uh, uh, projected to increase in terms of the intense hurricanes, not all hurricanes. Let's turn to adaptation, because this is actually where we are now. We're really in an implementation phase, at the very beginning of implementation of adaptation or development of resilience. So there's a very, very well-known risk uh, process, uh, risk management process. I won't go through all of them, but basically what we do is you, we, with whatever infrastructure or group or place, we identify the current and future. That's what we've been doing here together right now. We conduct the inventory of the infrastructure assets, and we should say people, who, to identify vulnerabilities, characterizing the risk, developing strategies, coordinate, as you all are working on right here today, prioritizing, preparing adaptation plans. Sounds very familiar. But this one, also very important, monitoring and reassessing. So this is one slide which is framing adaptation. To what is adaptation really? What are the goals? The goal is to reduce the level of physical, social, or economic impact of climate change and variability, and to take advantage of new opportunities emerging from climate change. So we can utilize these, uh, these uh, events, such as Sandy, to actually be, become more sustainable in the future. So adaptation can, these different, it can vary by type. Is it man management operations, how we do things? Infrastructure, we always think about that. But policies also in terms of changes in insurance programs to be more um, adapted to these changing conditions. They can be, adaptation is carried on by lots of different administrative groups. A lot, again, a main topic of our conversation of the panel that was in this room right now, right before this. Level of effort, some things are small, some things are bigger and take, take more funds. And timing, what makes sense in the short term? What makes sense in the long term? And then even by medium term and long term. And But we also now, especially with Hurricane Sandy, need to think about the uh, uh, potential for abrupt changes. And then the scales, are we doing things citywide or only in certain neighborhoods, isolated, unique, clustered, for example. Okay, let's turn towards to Hurricane Sandy. What was striking about Hurricane Sandy? First of, co of course, its magnitude. In all of the 300 years of our history, it was the highest, um, the highest coastal flooding. Um, it had the lowest recorded central pressure. This is the science part. It, and, and the wind field was, incredible, was very, very large. It was well forecast that the scientists really, the, our weather service, let's see if I have this. No, it doesn't have, don't we, I don't have a pointer. But you can see that the forecast of that left turn, left, left turn heading, heading west was well forecast. Here's a, a map, uh, here's a video of the actual storm. It's coming. It is. That's still. And we sometimes we still feel, maybe you all do too, that we're still in the eye wall of that storm in responding to it. What about the immediate preparations? We, New York City did issue the mandatory evacuation. Out-of-state utilities crews were brought in. MTA did close down. However, it was not enough because it was that super storm. As someone mentioned earlier, over 40 people died. 80% were from drowning. The utilities, while they did, they, while they were, they did try. It, they were not prepared enough. It's not only it was four million across the whole region, and of course we know the breakdowns in the uh, MTA. Just as I said that Sandy was well forecast, also the impacts actually were well forecast, and that's because of this group of researchers who have been working for over over a decade. These are some these are some of the books and reports that we put that were, that we had been put out. What had we learned from those all those that work that had been done? Two main things. It's those two those two points right at the top in blue that we have our region is a completely intertwined set of interdependent critical infrastructure systems and 
vulnerable communities. Those are the two things that are the real focus of what we need to do in terms of adaptation. And when you look at that map I showed you and then the hard hit areas, you can see that, that most of the hard hit areas were forecast in advance. So not only was the storm well forecast, but the impacts were too. This is the percent of population below poverty. This is building out to our Rockaway. These were three case studies in, uh, that were in the very, very first, which was published in 2001, Rockaway Peninsula, Coney Island, Lower Manhattan, and showing that many of the hardest hit areas are with, as you all know, in our, um, in our most vulnerable communities um, in terms of poverty. We, we are studying, our, lots and lots of folks on the research side are studying the impacts. We need to document them, we need to study, we need to learn from them so that we can do much, much, much better as we go forward. Um, I wanted to say one thing about the media, because here's a heads up, one of the questions we're gonna ask you is about the media. So after, during, during and after and still, um, we researchers were, we did a tremendous amount of media, over 100 interviews is probably way more than that now. What was very striking to us about the questions that the media were asking us is that, of, of course, they were asking about the Sandy forecasts and the impacts, but they also were making, those, question, those interviewers were making the connection with climate change, future impacts, climate adaptation, and planning. And that seemed to be real progress here. You know, I think after Katrina, there was sort of, is this climate change or not? But really, with Sandy, it was, it was very, very much more informed media coverage. Now, just to, just to come to the end, another, one question that we were asked in the media a lot was, wasn't, had New York been doing anything? So the answer is yes. And these are some of the things New York had been doing. Green streets, um, getting much better LIDAR, uh, sea level rise into the waterfront plan, uh, emergency response and preparedness. That evacuation plan was in place because of the preparations. But after Sandy, of course, as we all know, this is absolutely intensifying. I want to now move out from New York City to show and to share, because some of you I know work internationally, but also, so this is all put in context, that what we see in, in working with cities all all over the world, that cities, not only New York, are emerging as first responders to climate change. They are working, what, what, this, what the graph at the top is showing is the voluntary pledges of greenhouse gas uh, reductions that cities all over the world have undertaken. And, that, and the, and the uh, information is providing these great groups of cities, networks of cities that are getting going, not just on mitigation, but on adaptation as well. And this is very encouraging because very often, as we see, the progress on both some national levels and on international levels is actually slow. But it's very encouraging to see what the cities are finding. And it's because cities have experience, not just New York, cities have experience in responding to climate-related disasters. They're on the front lines of that. And they know that their city residents are clearly vulnerable to climate change, that many of their cities lack the lifelines needed to actually respond. So one of the very important points that, and I guess lessons learned that we have learned, is that city leaders are at the right level of governance to take action with more direct contact with the constituents, involved in day-to-day -day management, all the things that, that we're seeing happening now. But there are still many challenges, which we were talking about in the panel before, multiple jurisdictions, financing, the financing of mitigation and adaptation, uptake within and across, roles of small, medium, and large cities. That's something, for example, Rockefeller has been working on a lot in Asia, in medium-sized cities in Asia, in their great program that they have there. Um, and maintaining momentum across election cycles. This is very actually critical right here in New York City. So this is the final slide. In climate science, we talk about a lot about tipping points. And tipping points in physical science are when something, a process is slowly building up, and then all of a sudden, there's a threshold, and on the other side of that tipping point, there is a rapid acceleration. We have here, right here in our region, after Hurricane Sandy, for Hurricane Sandy to be the tipping point in responding to climate change. We have leadership in, why is that? First of all, the leadership. 
we have leadership through Mayor Bloomberg, we have, but we have leadership from all of you, from the foundations, from the corporations, from the private sector, from the community groups. We have the potential to all come together to actually make Hurricane Sandy the tipping point. And when, what I mean there is that in the re rebuilding, the recovery and the rebuilding, that we take the increasing risks due to climate change into account in our rebuilding. This is in contrast to after Hurricane Katrina, which they rebuilt to the former standards, really. They didn't really take these increasing risks into account. We have, for the first time, municipal, state, and federal alignment. It's really exciting. This is the real potential. And the final element of why we have the potential for this to occur is I do believe that it's because the climate science is in place and in time. Because we have the reports, that we have the foundation scientifically, so that we can all actually create, use this as a tipping point. And because we work internationally all over the world, this is our climate change and international cities uh, uh, assessment report, I know and we know that if New York City is able to be this tipping point, to provide this leadership, this will be a provide tremendous leadership, not just for our own country, but for cities and nations around the world. So thank you very much on this. Here's all the references. It's all here. <laughs> This was intended to be a, a bit of an interactive discussion, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Rosenzweig has some questions of the audience, which uh, I handed out a little handout that will help you text message. So it's really simple. What she's going to ask a few, ask you a few questions, and I actually. Can I get my connection if you're getting a signal that you're not getting any kind of connection you can connect to the Wi-Fi and thank you Jason <laughs> right. Uh, so you can kind of see the question up there already if you want to right. ask the you question you will answer and then you will answer and then I'm gonna give my answer <laughs> Is every oh yeah so are we ready yes I think so okay all right very good so we have extent of flooding was was the uh, really by far the the biggest surprise for all of you um, and then I think a lot said all of the above which is also I think very important um, my answer is none of the above because all of these things were in our reports from 2001. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what, we, what was surprising to us. The fires in Breezy Point, the gasoline shortages, and the hospital evacuations. We didn't realize that those things were, more, was, were so critical. So we still, there's still, of course, and you know, any storm, there's always going to be some surprises because we can't do it, you know, we're never going to be able to think of everything. But that's why this concept of resilience is so important, that we have to be preparing our region for resilience so that when we, that we can react to the surprises as well. Okay, let's go to the next one. I think there are four. So the second one is about the media. So... Do you feel that the media was effective in relaying information about Sandy?
Great. Okay. Fantastic. This is great. It's so instantaneous. <laughs> All right. So, actually, I, this is quite amazing. It's too bad we don't have some media colleagues here whom we, you know, work with a, a very much a lot. Um, but it, it seems like the the two thirds. Uh oh, the no's are coming up. <laughs> All right. Well, in the break, we're going to have to hear why, why, why you think why it wasn't effective. I just wanted to say the one thing that I just reiterate what I said is that I felt that there was, I think, serious coverage about the, for the part that that I that we work on, there was serious co coverage about the linkages to climate change and very informed coverage on that. So I would have put yes. Um, but, it's, uh, but, but I'm interested in hearing why, why, you know, in the break, why you thought no. Okay, let's go to the next one. And now this is also a media question, which is what is the best role for the media? Or it's actually like, what's the best media. medium? <laughs> Okay, so do you, for, this is for, for communicating about Hurricane Sandy. Is it social media, Facebook, that's all of that? Traditional TV, radios, and news media, official websites. Oh, we should have had this broken up by age of the That's right, definitely, <laughs> absolutely. We need our social science colleagues to design the survey. <laughs> right. And to, okay, so, all right. Uh, social media is coming up, and Irwin is here, right? Is Irwin Redliner here? Yes, he or he was he, certainly here earlier. Um, right, official websites is right. Okay, so um, uh, in regard to Hurricane Sandy, people seem to be uh, favoring the traditional TV news radio news media, I think for the thoughtful coverage, for the in-depth, as a scientist, okay, here's my, here's my resp brief response on this, because science is complicated. It's like, some, you know, our reports are like 200 pages long. It's pretty hard to do it in how many characters is Twitter, right? <laughs> to bring down science. So on the communicating of the science, it's pretty hard to do science on Twitter. Um, so the traditional is good. But the, the reason why I asked for Irwin, because they, they do on the emergencies and the social media for, the, for actually locating people who are hurt and all those kinds of things, absolutely. So I think each of them are good for different parts of it. I think that's the real answer. And let's go to the last one. Because this now, this is, we want to ask you, what are the emerging important research topics post Sandy? What would you like us to, um, us to research. What do you what do you need more information about? And I'm going to I'm going to modify this one just a little bit because I, you see this other. I'm going to characterize that. And this other is research on the communities, the social aspects, uh, health, all the human stuff. Because we had storm surge, we had this is more on some of the um, you, uh, kind of like nuts and bolts part of the science. But what about the people part? And do you need more information of that? So other stands for uh, social aspects. Great. All right, we'll give it about one more minute. Fantastic. Great. All right. So um, infrastructure adaptation, yes, definitely, it's huge. Can you actually imagine what it's going to take to actually adapt our infrastructure in New York City? But I do, you know, I gave, I've given several, similar, actually more detailed presentations to MTA, to the state DOT, and they are, they are beginning to take this all on board. So, but it's huge, actually, but, you know, we got to get in there and do it. Um, sea level rise. The other ones less, and then you know I'm glad that that you know that we that we that we characterize that other because clearly, and I think Nancy's going to uh, talk about this more. We've how do we how do we actually we need a lot more on communicating with and and understanding what's happening with the communities and the people. So Nancy, now Nancy, I think has some questions too. Okay. Um, and actually, the questions I think I'm going to head direct towards you all um, to get you started, and then you might have your own back for us. But um, we were wondering whether there are ways philanthropy is helping or can help communities receive the kind of science and policy information that was presented here. And, and then who would be the right messengers? And what's the right message frame for communities, particularly, you know, outs I don't think there's any city in the world 
um, there's certainly no other city in the U.S. that I know of, except maybe San Francisco, that has an, um, a climate change panel for New York City. I think the Rockefeller Foundation supported that yes, panel the first they did. round. Yes, thank you um, very much. And and so, <laughs> you know, what, how do we, how do other communities of smaller sizes get this kind of information if you think it's important that they have this information? And maybe a related question would be, what kind of uh, community or neighborhood scenario planning models have you encountered or might you think are needed to translate from the big science, these kinds of kind of big scenarios into, well, what do I do now if I'm the mayor of Hoboken? Or what do I do now if I'm the superintendent or whoever leads Long Beach and the community is divided about what to do? And anybody want to take a shot at those type questions, answering those kind of questions? Does anybody think those are important? <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Michelle? Can you say who you are, please? Yes. And where you're from? Great, thanks. across the state to, to play that next layer of uh, translation between science and federal bigger government all the way down to local municipal action. Yeah. And when you think, a lot of you answered that more, um, was it, I forget, was it research or information about resilient infrastructure? Does anybody who answered the need for that want to tell us about like what they, is it that you don't know what would make infrastructure more important or you wouldn't know how to help decide what investments would make? Somebody want to take a shot at elaborating what they were thinking when they answered that? And the reason I'm asking that from my own point of view is the foundation co-chaired uh, Governor Cuomo's resilience committee. You know, he had a ready committee, he had a response committee, and then the New York State 2100 committee, which was really about resilient infrastructure. Um, and we, we addressed this, and there's like a lot more work to do. I'm happy to hear from what I understand the mayor's picked up some of the recommendations, and we'll see what happens as it rolls out. I think something rolled out today from the governor's office. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it, and it, it was rich, but it leaves the community still having to make these decisions. But I'd like to hear from the philanthropist in here, like what were you thinking when you said we need more information or more research? Wow, a shy bunch. Forty-nine percent said they would, that we needed that, so yeah. or something like that. Right? Good. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Um, Rusty Stahl with NYU Wagner School and Tides Foundation. Um, I voted for other because um, uh, I think the human dimension was uh, discussed in the session um, in the conference room over there earlier. Um, that it, a lot about uh, social capital in neighborhoods um, and in communities really has to pre-exist um, a disaster so that people can come together across faith groups, uh, across you know other kinds of boundaries to uh, support one another. And also in the nonprofits that foundations support, uh, you know, th it's all about human capital in those organizations and sustaining people who themselves are in effect, uh, experiencing the disaster and trying to help and stay, uh, continue their programs. So I think if we overlook the other, the human dimension, it's to our own peril. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, see the hand up in the middle. learn from other hurricanes like Katrina is that communities are usually grappled with the decision of rebuilding and the reality is that they don't have the tools or the expertise to think through how they can um, adapt the way that they're living in order to be resilient and be mm -hmm. able to um, 
address the, the, the reality of that these storms are going to come again and being able to figure out how to support those communities as they think through the design process and making sure that they're engaged and they're part of that visioning for redesigning, I think that's a critical piece and I'm interested in the ways that funders can help that those aspects of the work. Mm -hmm. It's less about, because I think you had asked the question of um, uh, like who would be the entity, I think it's more like do I want to learn about it? It's less about what I would want to learn, more about how do we equip the communities to be able to understand like what they could put in place. Good, very helpful. Perfect. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, there's another hand up over there in the plaid Start shirt. Talking and I'll stop. <laughs> No, this is part of um, So I, I sort of was, I voted for the seawall actually because I thought that um, what's the point of continuously rebuilding if these storms are here and they're upon us and every five years or so you rebuild and then you get knocked down again to, get, to rebuild again. Um, isn't it kind of insane to just keep doing the same thing and getting the same results? So, you know, maybe there does need to be more mm -hmm investment in like really big um, projects mm -hmm. like that, like they did in the Netherlands in the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just comment on this about yeah, the barriers? And then I'd like to because, add that. yeah. <laughs> so for the first NPCC, the, uh, the Mayor Bloomberg has reconvened the NPCC and we're updating all the projections that I showed you and they're going to be um, presented shortly and you'll hear more about, uh, I think, in the f more about that in the <laughs> following panel. But the single most the single uh, topic that engendered the most discussion within the NPCC first round was the barriers. Um, because on the one hand, there are some very positive aspects about them because they're, they're, they, they're a large area and have the potential to provide that larger, more kind of quote citywide. But, but there are also issues both on the engineering side, how exactly they would be done, um, the ecological part, uh, what, how would it be affecting the ecosystems? And then third, the social aspects, because anything that you did like that would be protecting some places and not others. So what we came down to after hours of discussion was that, w that, we t that further research and de much more detailed research so we have a much better idea. Also because it is, they are the single most expensive potential infrastructure that we could uh, adaptation measure that we could take as a region. So it, again, it w and it would take a lot of community discussion around that to see that that is indeed what we would want to be uh, 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 promulgating. When there are when there are lots of other things that can be a portfolio approach with ecosystem approach, et cetera. What 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 are your, what are your thoughts on the barriers? I don't need to add anything mm -hmm. more substantively other than to say we had the same discussion in the New York State 2100 yeah. Commission and. Um, I chaired the land use subcommittee of that, which is where most of that discussion took place. And we came out the same place that the New York City panel did. But we also took it a step further and said, you know, by preference, the, the, the city and the state ought to focus on the natural, the green and the natural infrastructure solutions first, because you can, there are some really good designs for New York City, and we can start to build out on top of those and move those into feasibility studies. And in any case, you would do those first. These things would um, roughen up the bottom, slow the incoming tide, uh, delay or retard some of, the, um, some of the incoming storm effect. But then they would also have salutary effects for the city as a whole, even when a big event wasn't happening. So there, were, there are lots of things you would do long before you would spend money even doing an in-depth study of large storm surge barriers. And so that was where the 2100 report came out after probably the same kind of discussion <laughs> that Cynthia's um, group had. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask if there are regional funders in here who are trying to connect various parts of the post-Sandy efforts, like housing and environment and, and economic um, resilience. And if you wanted to talk about what kind of like data or knowledge or tools you could use that either haven't been talked about or have been touched on and moved off qu too quickly or you want to pull that together in a, in a way that you've heard about through the course of today. Yeah, please. Um, so I just want to echo uh, Rusty and say I think what 
has always been great about your work, Cynthia, is the social dimension of this. You know, you told this 15 years ago, and I was at a board meeting in uh, February, and one of our board members fessed up, it's a new board member, and said I was at the original Earth Day, and there was a presentation that said New Orleans and New York were the two places that were gonna get slammed in the age of climate change. So I guess what's striking to me throughout in the questions, and I was glad you put the context on other, is because it was so clear that the effects of the storm were uneven. So the question of vulnerability and how philanthropy could really take more of the social dimension piece on just feels strikingly absent from the discussion. And I would hope that we would really dig deep, deep, deep on that um, and look at this question of how federal money is coming down. I think the other thing that was missing from Plan 2112 uh, or 20, whatever the name of it is. Plan YC. Uh, Plan YC yeah. is just the whole question of the food system. So mm -hmm. there's a group of us organized around community food funders, which is a new regional philanthropic organizing mm -hmm. project. We're not calling it an affinity group. Um, and we're gonna do a series of breakfasts in May and June to look at the question of what happened with the food system because Irene really whacked the producers. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to one of our grantee partners today and talking about how the upstate area is really um, the city and a lot of the consumers and customers of the um, community supported agriculture really supported upstate farmers and how when Sandy hit it, it flowed the other way and a lot of farmers donated their surplus food into the hardest hit areas. So I think the food layer is just a, such an important piece of this because so many communities had neighborhood stores that were without food on the shelves and couldn't get fresh food were it not for the Occupy Sandy crowd and how quickly they moved to get hot meals into a lot of these areas. To comment on that, very much um, uh, urban food systems are really a hot topic, not just here. It's really emerged in the just really the, the last few years of how important this is. And in our international work, that's emerged as a hot topic in cities around the world. So we're going to have a chapter in our uh, IPCC for cities on the, on urban food systems. And actually at Bellagio, because I was just there this week, for uh, we, we I just actually wrote the section about um, urban food systems to be part of a sustainable development goal globally. But I think a really important point to pull out is our, we're implicitly understand that it was about the region, that it wasn't urban or... Oh, uh, that's absolutely true. E that. Yes, and absolutely, th yes, uh, thank you for be emphasizing that, that it's really, it's the urban and rural surrounding uh, uh, areas um, together, and it's then that interlocking system, which we need to study, bring forward, I think, support. Hi, uh, Vince Staley. I'm executive director of Media Impact Funders, and I just wonder, knowing what we know here, and having known it two years ago or four years ago, um, all of this incredibly um, persuasive, rational uh, data um, is kind of missing, uh, is, is not reaching uh, large parts of the political public. And it seems that uh, a declining number of people believe in the impact of climate change, right? And so I just wonder, how do we reach people who are um, uh, moving away from the belief in this data um, how do you convey this? Uh, it seems like there's, there's some mm -hmm. other than a purely rational mm -hmm. uh, display of the data. Yeah. Nancy, you want to want to start first because do you do you encourage these kinds of do you work on media at all? Uh, we do some. We've funded three groups to focus specifically on climate communications and also to think about how to communicate about climate change and other kinds of resilience. But um, I'm not much of an expert. I have to say, I moved to New York a little bit. Of, over a year ago, and it's kind of a relief to live in a city where that's not generally questioned by people after living in Washington for a long time. <laughs> so I'm not really the right yeah. person to ask. Um, I would say, though, that when, as the impacts are piling up and increasing, in my work, what I sometimes think about, who do you have to, who do you have to convince that this is because of human-caused climate change and is accelerating? And I think the number of those people are much smaller than the number of people who Needs, just need some help understanding that things are happening and that they can do something about it. They can become more resilient and they can support planning and other kinds of changes instead of being really passive. That's a larger group. And then there's some people you would never convince. And I, you know, I turn to Cynthia to see if she just thinks I'm chickening out on that. But I do think mm -hmm. there's like a, a group of people you might never have to push to agree that it 
isn't sunspots, <laughs> but mm -hmm. it's, there is something happening because it's been happening to them. Right, there'll always be a, a, a percentage of people who will, not, um, who will not come on board. That's, I, I agree with you with there. But um, two things, I do think, uh, although maybe you are, you are uh, familiar with the very latest polling, but I do think that there was a bump up after Sandy um, in terms of um, uh, int awareness int and interest um, in awareness of the issue and then the, the need to, uh, to address it. That's one thing. The second thing is, I've been doing this for quite a while, as, as you can see, and a, a while ago, even quite a long time ago, I and actually many science colleagues realized that just presenting, it's that it, of course, just the rational part of it is not enough. And so there are wonderful programs now that team us with artists from all different media. I'll just tell you about one project I did because it was so fascinating. I worked with an electronic uh, sonification artist we gave her the model output from our global climate model, which we're always looking at graphs. I've just showed you all the graphs, right? And she associated electronic sounds to each of the climate variables. And so we, and we did joint presentations together in which you would hear the underlying warming going, getting higher and higher, you know, like stronger and stronger and stronger. And then, you, then it would be punctuated by, um, by the, uh, the intense precipitation events. Just an example that, and so uh, to the extent that we can, we're very busy right now with post-Hurricane Sandy recovery, but, um, and providing the, the information for the, for, the, um, for, the, to, for the resilience measures. But we, um, but to the extent that we can, we really, really welcome that, those kinds of programs. And some of them relate to, for example, and I know you know this, but who the messenger is. So one mm -hmm. of the groups we're supporting is Georgetown Climate Center, and they're partnering with the National um, Center for Atmospheric Research. And that's the club of all the PhD giving uh, atmospheric science programs in the country. And around the country, state governments will rely on their PhD scientists, meteorologists, to ask them what's going on. So that's like that's that strategy because the governor and the legislature is going to ask their state meteorologist mm -hmm. who's going to come out of their state university, and so we're working on that communication. And then there's another grant to um, Climate Central, and there's a few other groups that do similar work and probably equal quality about you know what do people hear and how do they hear it and how do they understand it. And um, that's really you know it's a specialization, and we all know after sort of losing the political battle on climate change where it matters the most that we have to get better at this. It's not me that's going to figure that out. So there are a number of donors who've been making these, these kind of grants. There's another kind of communication, though, that is really important when we think about right in this area, the Sandy rebuilding has to do with, you know, people keep talking about these FEMA flood maps. How, that's not that easy to understand. It's easier when you see them in pictures. Oh, I'm in the red zone. And maybe that's all people need to understand. But if you are um, in charge of making a decision on public infrastructure or you're you know, going to have make a decision as a community what to do with the governor's offer to buy out, whether to do it or not, what do you, do, wh how do you understand a one in a hundred year flood? Do, does that make sense to you? I, it doesn't, I don't think to most people. Does, do you know that means there's a 1% chance any year that your house would get flooded? What does that mean if I'm going to build something now and I have a 30-year mortgage? What are the odds that I'm going to go through a Sandy again? So I think we also have to think about that kind of communication, which doesn't really have anything to do with why it floods, but what's going to happen. Yes, definitely. And uh, as our, one of the NPCC2, the reconvened group that is active right now, uh, that is one of our topics. So we are working on that right now. We had Those to stand in front of all of you to understand that we're doing the same thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> I wish we could have done it for two hours, but no one would come to a six-hour annual meeting, so <laughs> thank you so much.